Awesome singing, church. <laughs> Thanks for the support. Appreciate that. Amen. So, family, let's start our Bibles in Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. One of my favorite passages in the Word of God. Amen. In Mark chapter 12, we're going to pick it up in verse 28. The Bible says in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? You know, what's amazing is that Jesus was always approached. For Jesus to want time alone, yeah, right. People are always looking for Jesus to debate with Jesus. And so at this moment of time, a man asked him, which is the most important commandment? Verse 29. Jesus says, the most important one, answer Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second one is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, when Jesus was asked this question, he could have said anything, guys. But he said the most important commandments was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He repeated Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. See, why do we come to church? We come because we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why do we go to Bible talk? We go because we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What we do, the reason why we do things, it has to be based on our love for God. Because it's all about God. You know, in the New Testament, this is in Greek. And there's many different meanings of the word love in New Testament in Greek. There's storja, which is family love. There's phileo, which is brotherly love. That's where you get Philadelphia, amen, city of brotherly love. Although it's not the city of brotherly love, I, I'm from there, amen. <laughs> it's, a, it's a city of brotherly hate, amen. <laughs> and then there's agape, the highest devotion of love. The only way Jesus communicated was through agape love. He represented agape love. Do you know Jesus was the only one to fulfill this scripture perfectly? He perfectly loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. There was nothing that came in the way between Jesus and his relationship with God because God was his priority. You know, it's amazing. The Bible says, with all your strength. Love God with all your strength. And what does that mean? That's what we're going to focus on today. It means with all of our ability, with all of our energy, our whole being to love God with everything you have. But what we find is loving God with perseverance it can create some fatigue in us and we can get weary. But every moment and every opportunity offers a chance to love the one who made us, which is God himself. Do you realize that God gives us strength to love him? Which is weird, God says love me, but when we seek him, he gives us the strength to be able to love him. That's the power of God. The title of today's lesson, all your strength, all your strength. You know, today we're going to study out the book of Judges. In the time of Judges, the word just means leaders. At this moment in time, it was the darkest days in Israel. And it seemed like very few loved God with all their heart, love, uh, mind, soul, and strength. You know, in the book of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes because there was no central leader. And we have to understand the importance of leadership, guys. If we had an organization but there was no CEO, what do you think would happen to that organization? It would be chaos. If, 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 if you have a store with no manager, what do you think would happen to that store? It's chaos. When there's no leadership, there's no one to make the decisions. And everybody's like, hey, what do you think? Oh, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Somebody make a decision. <laughs> but it takes a leader making the decision. You know, let's turn our Bible to Judges chapter 13. In a time of darkness, God wants light to shine brightest. In Judges chapter 13. You know, 
as we study out the Old Testament, the Old Testament is the physical realities of spiritual truths. See, in the Old Testament, we learn what to do when worshiping God, and we also learn what not to do when worshiping God. It's no joke to have your name in the Bible. Guys, either you've done something very, very good, or you've done something very, very bad. Amen. But in Judges chapter 13, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1, it says again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. As I said before, the Old Testament's physical realities of spiritual truths. And at this moment in time, because of the Israelite sin, they were enslaved for 40 years. It wasn't one year. It wasn't three years. It wasn't even 10 years. 40 years of slavery. So we understand what sin does to us. You know, it's a common cycle in the book of Judges. First, the people are in sin. Then they're suffering. And then when they realize how bad it is, they're like, they cry out to God. But by the mercy of God, he sends them a deliverer or a leader to rescue them. And then when they're free, they're like, man, this is amazing. This is awesome. I have rest. I have peace. And then you know what happens? They go back to sin. It's the same cycle over and over and over again. But as disciples, we break the cycle. Amen? And we don't turn back to sin. We keep changing. Let's pick it up in verse 2. The Bible says, A certain man of Zorah, named Manoah, from the clan of Danites, had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head, because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. It's crazy that awesome is in the Bible, amen? It says, I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now then drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because a boy will be a Nazarite of God from birth until the day of his death. Today we're going to study out one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Samson. And Samson, Samson was the 13th judge in Israel. And God had a great plan for his life. You know, the word Samson means brightness. That's what it means. So literally in a time of darkness, God was raising up Samson to bring light to the world in a time of darkness. I find it pretty incredible that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, disciples are called to be the light of the world. See, the world is dark. We are night lights, spiritual night lights. Amen? You know, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. But everywhere we go, we're called to be the light of the world. You know, at this moment, Samson's birth was foretold. He was one of five in the Bible that was foretold. See, there's Isaac. There's also Samuel. There's John the Baptist. And of course, Jesus Christ, his birth was foretold. So God had a plan for Samson, even in his mother's womb. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Do you realize that God had a plan for your life before you were even born? As you were in your mother's womb, God's like, I got a plan for him to do something great. I got a plan for her to do something amazing on this earth. But the question is, will we live up to the plan that God has for us? But of course, it comes with loving God with all of our strength. The Bible says, since birth, he's called to be a Nazarite, set apart to God. So when the angel of the Lord appears to this woman, the woman says she has been childless, guys. And during those times, if you didn't have a child, that's an embarrassment. So for this man... This angel of the Lord had come to this woman during this time and said, you will have a child. God makes impossible things possible. And that's how our God works. So at this moment, he told this woman, and this woman tells her husband, and there's a requirement for Samson as well, as in Nazarite. He must leave his hair uncut. So we know that this man had very long hair, amen? He must drink no wine. He must eat no grape products. He must avoid contact with anything dead. It was a lifetime vow to death. 
And that's how he was called to live, because he was called to be set apart. Jump over to verse 21. The Bible says in verse 21, same chapter, Judges chapter 13, verse 21. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things. Or now told us this. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahana, Dan, between Zorah and Esther. You know, right here, we realize that this wasn't an angel, guys. The Bible says the angel of the Lord. And they knew that they have seen God. What we find is that this is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. But Samson was born and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. You know, it's amazing for those who are baptized disciples. Do you know that God's allowed the spirit of God to come inside of you? You have Jesus with you wherever you go. And the spirit is stirring. And we got to feed the spirit with the word of God. Amen. Oh, your strength. Point number one, God gives strength. You know, Samson was given supernatural strength by God. He, he didn't have to do anything to get this strength. He was just given to it by God. Amen. Let me tell you guys what this guy was able to accomplish through the strength that God gave him. He killed a lion with his bare hands. I don't know if anybody in this audience has killed a lion with their bare hands. That's, that, that's, 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 that's good. Maybe Alfonso, Alfonso, the rest of the lions and stuff. Guys, that's intense to kill a lion with your bare hands. You got to be in great shape for that, amen? He killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. How did he do that? I don't know, amen? He carried a gate of a city up a mountain. These are great feats that God allowed him to do because God gave him the strength. But you know something? Samson probably wasn't this big, bulky guy. Do you know why? Because they tried to find a secret to his strength. He wasn't a guy that appeared strong or like big. He was a guy that just looked like everybody else. And that's why the power of God is so great that he will use this man to do the impossible. See, God gives strength. I think the great thing to know from this is that Samson was in shape. And for us, family, we need to focus on our health and our fitness. Amen? I think what's special with the campus uh, devotional, uh, we had it this Thursday. And I talked about how to take care of yourself. You got to rest and you got to work out. You got to take care of your temple that God has given you. Because God cares if you live a long time. God wants you to live a long time to preach the word of God, but God can take your life as well early. Amen? But we want to live great lives. We want to be healthy and work on our health. Amen? God gives strength. You know, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, you don't have to turn there. But the Bible says, love God with all your strength. That word strength is translated ability and talents. Everyone has an ability or talent given to them by God, whether they're in the kingdom or outside the kingdom. Everybody has an ability or talent given to them by God. You know, it's pretty great to watch the Super Bowl that passed in February and uh, the Chiefs won, amen, which is great. But what I noticed was Patrick Mahomes at such a young age, I don't think he had, what, four Super Bowls he has already? He's not even 30 yet. Oh, three, amen, I was wrong, all right. <laughs> Correct me, please. But he's recognized as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. But what he, he's known for is his arm strength. That's what he's known for. They say he can throw the football 80 yards. I might can throw out 20. Maybe that's a little too much of myself. Maybe, maybe 15. All right, all right, all right. Maybe 10. I only can throw 10. Hey, man, hey, you got me. But to throw a football 80 yards, that's intense. You know, no matter how much weightlifting I do, I could be in the gym 24 hours a day. No matter how many push ups I do, I could do 1,000 push ups a day. No, no, no matter how many illegal drugs I take, I could take them every single day. I will never be able to throw 80 yards like Patrick Mahomes. Do you know why? It was a God-given gift. Are you guys with me? You know, there's Mike Tyson, one of the greatest heavyweights ever. He was known for his power. You know, would you take a million dollars if you were asked to be hit by Mike Tyson? I'll 
don't second guess that because he could kill you, amen? <laughs> but he was known for his power, guys. But it doesn't matter how many illegal drugs I take. It doesn't matter how many push-ups I do. I can have stones in my gloves. I will still never be able to hit as hard as Mike Tyson because it's a natural gift that he has. Are you guys with me? And everyone on this earth has a natural ability in something. Look at Romans chapter 12. And you guys know where I'm going, amen? Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Amen. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern generously. And if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. You know what's special about this? If you have a question and you ask God, hey, what is my will here? What is my will? Well, the Bible says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Offer yourself. Give your all. See, Paul is writing to the Roman church to give everything that got to God in his church. Offer our bodies as living sacrifices. And of course, we got to renew our minds with the scriptures. And the Bible here, it says, we're one body with many different functions. And we all have different gifts. So Paul believed that everybody in church of Rome has some type of gift. And he said, man, the gifts of prophesying, which is preaching in the New Testament, serving, teaching, encouragement, contributing, leadership, and mercy. See, the reason why he wrote this is because he wanted people to give all of their strength to him. Look at another scripture. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, another powerful passage. In 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to pick it up in verse 7, or verse 8. The Bible says, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one shall use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in his various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And the church says, Amen. You know, our gifts and our talents are meant to be used to build up God's kingdom. See, the fact that you are different, nobody else can be like you, guys. What you offer, nobody else can offer. That's why every single piece in the kingdom of God is so important. But the question is, are we using our strengths more for the world than for God? You know, if I were to walk around your job and see you working and use your talents and ability for work, would I look in the kingdom and say, is that the same person? Who is that? You see, God not only wants us to use our abilities at our jobs, but how much more so in the kingdom of God? My encouragement to you is don't hide your gifts. But yet, if you don't use it, you lose it. You know, over the course of 14 years, which is not that long, amen, in 14 years, but I feel like I've grown up in the kingdom somewhat. At 22 years old, I'm 37 now. But I served in many different roles. 
Uh, at one point, I handled the songbooks, and uh, that was a very important role for me. I made sure that songbooks were on time. I made sure not one was missing. And every Sunday, I was here early. Songbooks. That was my, you know, role right there. And then I remember ushering. And uh, guys, I started as one of the ushers, then I became a lead usher. But at that time, I was like, why would anybody put me as a lead usher? I have no idea what I'm doing. Amen. <laughs> Peter, you're well ahead of me. Amen. <laughs> then I remember I was in Kids Kingdom. And at that time, you were in Kids Kingdom for six months of the year. So a lot of us think Kids Kingdom was like prison time, Kids Kingdom. No, but it's not prison time. We're serving the next generation. Amen. But I love being in Kids Kingdom. Why? Because I learned what it takes to love a kid. And now I had a son of my own. And now I learned, I learned how, to be, how to be a father or someone. Amen? You know, ever since I was baptized, I loved the scriptures. And I felt it was in me to preach the word of God. I felt that was always in me. But the one thing that stopped me from doing it, insecurity. See, I was afraid of people. I remember we had a campus devotional and the brother was like, hey, why don't you come up? Oh, it's Jerry McGee from Tampa, amen? <laughs> we were roommates at the time. He said, man, I want you to preach for a campus devotion. I was like, me? Preach? Like, preach what? <laughs> like, Christ, I was going to preach. <laughs> preach a lesson. I was like, bro, that's, that's way too much for me. That's, that's too much. I can't, I can't do that. Come on. So I confirmed the preach and I got on stage and I started preaching. And guys, I was about to pass out. <laughs> I was in no place to be in front of people at that time. I was so afraid to be in front of people. So it was a hindrance because I couldn't, I, I just didn't want to use my gift because I was so afraid of people. Are you filled with insecurity today about your gift? What God has given you to where the point where you're hiding your gift and we don't even know what you do. We don't know what you're good at. You got to be confident that God has given you a gift. You know, the plan is, number one, you got to believe you have a strength from God. See, insecurity is of Satan. God did not call us to be insecure but to be confident and walk in the power of the Spirit. Number two, you got to know your strength. You got to pray and ask others. You know, sometimes we can be deceived on what we think is our strength, but it really not. Amen? <laughs> but we got to ask and get advice and be humble about it and get help with that. Amen? Number three, we got to use our strengths effectively, effectively for God. And it starts in our Bible talks, our smart groups. It starts everywhere where we call and walk with God. We got to be committed. We got to love. We got to give, guys. Because our strength is used to build up God's church. God gives strength. Point number two, we choose our spiritual strength or physical strength. Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. So Samson at this point is older. And we're going to see his life and learn some things from him. In Judges chapter 14. I'm going to pick it up in verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1, Samson went, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? But you go, you, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines? to get a wife. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines, for at that time, they were ruling over Israel. Point number two, we choose our spiritual strength or physical strength. You know, Samson saw a Philistine woman. He's like, man, I want to marry that woman. But the problem was, she was not an Israelite. What that meant was that she did not worship God. But maybe she, on the outside appearance, she had some spirituality. I mean, she, she talked about God, right? <laughs> but she wasn't of God's people. But when he talked to his parents, his parents was like, no, they're strongly against it. But he said, get her for me. So Samson was right in his own eyes. You know, for us as disciples, daily non-Christians is like mixing oil and water. It don't mix. Amen. You're talking about following God. They're talking about TV shows. It just doesn't work, guys. A disciple marries a disciple. It has the same conviction, same heart. But we see Samson here, he was a little naive. Amen. And it wasn't love, it was lust. 
If you look at a girl one time, you say, I'm going to marry her. What? what about her? Do you want to marry about her? What? You don't even know her. What? It doesn't make no sense, guys. But he was being led away by his emotions and his feelings. You know, with marriage, marriage takes character, guys. It's very difficult in marriage, but it's very awesome as well, too. Amen? It is. It's challenging but amazing, guys. But the main thing about marriage is that you got to love God more than your spouse. you got to give God all your strength even more than your spouse. Marriage is challenging, but it's amazing in every way. My wife has changed me so, many, so much over the past 14 years. But this was all according to God's plan. He allowed Samson to sin so he could destroy the Philistines. Let's keep reading in verse 5. The Bible says, Sam, Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman and he liked her. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion carcass. And it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. The Bible says that he went down, and yes, he was going down. He was going down spiritually, amen? But then it says he approached the vineyards, and all of a sudden, a lion comes out to attack Samson. So when reading this, you're like, well, why would a lion come out to attack Samson? It's not God with Samson. Well, remember, the vow he has taken as a Nazarite. He went against it, according to Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. He wasn't supposed to be around vineyards. See, the lions in the Old Testament was meant for judgment. But in the New Testament, we understand that it's Satan himself. He rolls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. See, this is a warning from God because Samson was playing with the word of God. And sometimes we can play with the word of God like it's a game. But these words are not meant for comedy, guys. These are meant for life. And we have to take it. Serious. You know, he went back to the lion and also took the honey from the dead carcass and gave some to his parents. But he didn't tell them. Do you know why? Because he knew he was in sin. That's why he didn't tell his parents. You see, we choose our spiritual strength or physical strength. See, when we become disciples, we have a choice to rely on our own strength or rely on the spirit and God's strength. I believe the biggest temptation we may have is our physical strength is as strong enough to overcome our sinful nature. Our physical strength is strong enough to overcome our sinful nature. Many have tried, even in the Old Testament, and have failed. What makes us think that our physical strength can overcome our sinful nature? See, what we see in sin with Samson is he was in solitary and he had hidden sin, in which he sinned against his parents by not saying anything. But we must understand that when people are not around and when we're by ourselves, see, people don't see our sin, but you know who sees our sin? God. And he sinned against his parents. You know, family, when we're sinned against, then we believe that God will handle our situation. After we talk to the person and we feel sinned against, do we believe that God has the power to handle our situation? See, when we don't believe, it creates bitterness in our hearts. And then we feel like, oh, man, they did this to me. I want revenge. No, allow God to be the one who takes revenge. Are you guys with me? But at this moment in time, we have to understand that it's essential. Spiritual strengths are not based on talent. Humility. You know, Samson, the only time he was given direction was from his parents. So his parents were, quote, unquote, his discipling partners in a sense. Yet he didn't want to listen even to his parents. His parents said, that, that, that woman is no good for you. No, get her for me. And you couldn't convince him otherwise because you're so stuck on his feelings and emotions. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. You know, humility is very hard to come by. It's very difficult. 
And the ones that say, I'm humble, no, you're prideful, amen. If you have to say you're humble, you're prideful, amen. <laughs> in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 1, the Bible says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Take the very nature of his servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Bible talks about Jesus Christ. And it also says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vacancy. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. You know, for me, I find that challenging at times, especially when I'm prideful. I'm like, you, you, you mean to tell me I'm sorry, this brother that sinned yesterday, I got to consider him better than myself? That's true humility right there, guys. But what we find, we got to take the attitude of Jesus Christ. Although he was God, he didn't walk around saying, I'm God, listen to me. But yeah, he was just like everybody else, but had the power of God. He made himself nothing. Till this day, 14 years later, I'm still trying to grasp this scripture. I only can go so deep, but it's more deeper than you possibly can think, guys. He made himself, this is God in the flesh, walking around, making himself nothing and being humble. I find that the older you are, the harder it is to be humble. I was a lot more humble when I was younger as a Christian, I'll tell you that. Now it's like, oh, no, I know, I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me. Oh, I, I read that scripture before. That's when you know you're real prideful, when you're like, oh, oh, I read that scripture before. What makes you think that you mastered the scripture, that you don't have to be read to it again? What, what, like, what, what, where's the pride at in that, guys? Even today, I always think I'm right at times, guys. And sometimes I have to be corrected. Even me, myself, I can fall into pride. Pride, anyone can fall into it. We got to be humble. We got to fight to humble ourselves and make ourselves nothing. We got to listen to others in our life. It takes humility to get advice. And we got to be open-minded to advice as well. Now, is this a sin not to take advice? No, it's not a sin. It's not a sin if you don't take advice. But is it wise not to take advice? But also being open-minded. You ever been in those times where you're like, oh, what's your advice, bro? What's your advice? What's your Oh, that's, that's what I'm going to follow. You're not open-minded. You already had an idea what you wanted to do. Amen? <laughs> but being humble takes getting advice from brothers and sisters that are in your life. You know, humility allows us to fully submit to God. Humility will help us to avoid the negative effects of pride. Humility keeps us from sin. Humility increases our gratitude. Humility gives us a desire to be kind. You know what I found in my life over and over? is that when I don't listen to men that read scriptures to me in my life, God takes care of me, amen? And he humbles me, guys. God humbles me, and I got to learn over and over and over again. And I might be prideful later today, amen? But God is merciful, and he humbles us so that we can be totally reliant on him. Are you guys fighting to be humble today, guys? You know, due to pride and relying on his own strength, Samson put himself in unnecessary trouble. So that girl from the Philistines, he married her. And, I, you know, it would be cool to say that was a very happy marriage. They did very well. Turned out she died as well as her father died as well too. It didn't work out and it started a war between him and the Philistines. In chapter 16, Samson did not learn his lesson. And then he started sleeping with a prostitute. But then he finds Delilah and he says, man, I love her, right? He puts himself in enemy's territory. And he goes to Delilah. Then she started working for the Philistines. And the Philistines are like, hey, trick him so we can know the secret to his strength. And Del Del Delilah manipulated Samson. And he eventually tells her the secret of his strength. He told her, man, I'm a Nazarite. If my hair is gone, I become as weak as any other man. So you know what that woman did? When he was sleeping, she had a man come in and shave off his hair. 
Let's turn to Judges chapter 16, verse 20. And family, we just learned from this passage uh, what to do and what not to do. Amen? In Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Then she called, this is Delilah, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. You know, it's interesting, what's crazy is that he thought the Lord was with him when his hair was gone. But he broke his vow and the Lord left him. We must understand that he left God before God left him. It starts with us leaving God. God does not leave us. We leave him. And then therefore he can't be with us. At this point in time, the strongest man to ever walk this on this earth other than Jesus Christ, his eyes were gouged out and he was made a slave grinding in their dungeon. But the mercy of God, his hair started growing back. And see, God was not done with Samson. Point number three, and our final point. God's strength is always stronger. Verse 23. The Bible says, Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who will laid waste our, our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, O oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. O oh, God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, braced himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might. And down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. They brought him back and buried him between Zorah and Esau in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. Point number three, God's strength is always stronger. At this moment of time, Samson is distressed. And all he can do is rely on God. Because when we are on the lowest point of our lives, who do we look to? Let me tell you something. We're not prone to look horizontally. We're prone to look vertically. And he looked to God. And the Bible says that he asked God to give him strength. You know, Samson finally learned that his strength came from God. He asked God to allow him to perform one final act of strength. This time, he trusted in God and was able to kill more of the enemies in his final work for God than he did his whole life. See, God's strength is always stronger. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. You may have had a rough week, but are you engaged to worship God with all your strength to repent and go back to God? See, right here, Samson did not give up. He turned back to God. And God gave him the strength that he needed for what he did. My question is, do you feel weak now, family? I want to show you a passage. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we got one more after this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7. Another powerful, strong man in the word of God, spiritually. 
verse 7. The Bible says to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's power is made perfect in weakness. God wants us to be weak so we can rely on him for his strength. We got to love God with all our hearts, minds, and strength. You know, if we have it rough loving God when we are weak, how hard it will be to love God when we are strong. You got to choose to love God. You got to rejoice in the weaknesses because that's where God's power comes in. Let's go to our very last scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find something that's profound. If you really study out the life of Samson, we'll see something that's really profound. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 11, verse 32. The Bible says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson. Samson. Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. I find it amazing that Samson's name is in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. Every time you see Samson falling, 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 but it's not how you start, it's how you finish. He was a hero in the faith. And he chose to love God with all his strength at the end of his life. You know, family, in 2024, this is the type of mindset we need to have as a church. Every one of us, including myself, we need to fight and strive to love God with all of our strength. We got to give God everything, guys. Each one, reach one. Every one of us can make an impact to win a person for Christ this year. But it says giving your full heart to the kingdom of God, understanding that you are needed and understanding that God has a plan for your life. You know, Samson's life was cut short. He could have led Israel for 20 more years. But his death showed us something. It showed us it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And you have the spiritual strength of God. But it takes a decision to worship God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul in all your strength. Love you guys. Thank you.